Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. From today, we shall be resuming our weekly explained series with special focus on the upcoming mains exam. So if you're finding these initiatives to be helpful, you know what to do. Like the videos, share your comments and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. So the topic for today is AFSPA, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. This law is considered to be one of the most controversial pieces of legislation. AFSPA is in place in a few conflict zones of India and it has been alleged that this legislation has contributed to gross human rights violations in India's conflict zones. Several experts and activists, they have said that AFSPA is a draconian law. It's even been said that a law like AFSPA has no place in a democratic country like India. So this makes it very clear that AFSPA has been very, very controversial. But on the other hand, the government and the armed forces, they have strongly defended the need for AFSPA. They say that a law like AFSPA is necessary to fight against insurgency and terrorism. So basically there are two sides to the argument here. So in this session, let us have a balanced discussion. Let's be as unbiased as possible and take a look at both sides of the argument. This topic is going to be very important for your mains and we need to get into the details of this topic. We should understand why this topic is in news. What is the background? Where is AFSPA operating currently? What are the provisions of this law? Why is it controversial? And what are the two different sides of the argument which has led to this controversy? And of course, at the end, we shall also discuss a way forward as a part of the conclusion. Okay? But first, let's understand as to why this topic is in news. See, around two weeks ago, on the 4th of December 2021, in the northeast of India, the Indian Army was planning to conduct a counter-insurgency operation. Most of you might know that the northeastern states of India are deeply affected by various insurgent movements. In Nagaland, we have a district known as the Mon District. In the Mon District, the Indian Army has been deployed in a counter-insurgency role. And according to reports, the Indian Army had received intelligence that a group of insurgents were expected to be moving around in the Mon district of Nagaland. So to intercept these insurgents and to possibly neutralize them, the Indian Army planned an operation. The para special forces or the para commandos were deployed by the Indian Army based on this intelligence input and they laid an ambush for these insurgents. Then during the operation, the para commandos, they encountered a truck which was moving around suspiciously. The Indian Army has claimed that the commandos on the ground warned the truck to stop, but the truck did not follow the orders, thus raising the suspicion of the commandos who were part of the operation and believing them to be insurgents, believing the occupants of the truck to be insurgents, they engaged the occupants and they opened fire. When the operation ended, the occupants of the truck were dead. Six people were killed. But unfortunately, none of them were insurgents. All of them were innocent civilians. They were workers in a nearby coal mine who were returning back home after work. So this incident led to a major backlash in Nagaland, particularly in the Mon district. Because the workers who had been killed, they belonged to a subgroup of the Naga tribe Known, known as the Konyaks, the Konyak Nagas. The Konyak Nagas are the native inhabitants of the Mon district of Nagaland. The Konyaks are a sub-ethnic group of the much larger Naga tribe. So after this incident happened, there was massive outrage across the state of Nagaland and especially in the Mon district. So the locals, they organized themselves and to protest against this killing, they tried to storm into nearby base camps of the Indian Army and the Assam Rifles. So this led to a violent clash between the protesters and the security forces. So during these clashes, 
the protest took a violent turn and the security forces again opened fire against civilians. By the end of it, eight more civilians were dead along with a soldier of the Indian Army. So in these two incidents, a total of 15 people were killed and 14 of them were civilians. So this is where ASPA becomes controversial. After this incident, there was a massive outrage against the Indian Army. The Indian Army later acknowledged that this was a botched operation which went wrong and blamed intelligence failure for the mess up that had happened. Even the government of India acknowledged that civilians had been killed and the Union Home Minister Amit Shah regretted these killings and he immediately constituted an SIT to thoroughly investigate this incident. But by this time, in Nagaland, emotions were boiling and the people were angry. Because generally in the northeastern states which have been affected by insurgency, the locals, they hold a grudge against ASPA which has given enormous powers to the security forces. So it's often been alleged that security forces, while carrying out their counter-insurgency duties, they often abuse the law, misuse the powers to violate the human rights of the locals. In fact, after this incident, the chief minister of Nagaland himself, along with the chief ministers of other northeastern states, like the CM of Meghalaya and other chief ministers and political leaders, they all raised their voice against ASPA and called upon the central government to repeal this controversial law. This law is in operation not just in the northeast of India, it's also in operation in Jammu and Kashmir, which is another theatre of conflict for India. It was also imposed previously in the state of Punjab, but later has been revoked. We'll come to those details a little later. But what you need to understand is that wherever ASPA has been enforced, Right? Wherever ASPA has been implemented, that is in India's conflict zones, it has always led to allegations that gross human rights violations have taken place. The allegation is against the Indian security forces, that's the Indian Army, India's paramilitary forces like Assam Rifles and CRPF, and as well as against state police forces, which also gain special powers through the law that is ASPA. So since many, many years, there is a long-standing a long standing demand for the repeal of this controversial law. So it's because of this incident that ASPA is in news. The incident had a nationwide impact. All major media outlets covered the incident. All newspapers came out with editorials criticizing ASPA and some of its provisions. Many experts, including legal experts and human rights activists, they all called for the repeal of ASPA. Like I said, it has been labeled as a draconian law. Now that's a very strong term which has been used to refer to this legislation. Several organizations have labeled ASPA as a, as a law which gives sweeping powers to the armed forces with blanket immunity. Whereas on the other hand, the armed forces and the government, they have strongly defended the law and they say that such a law is necessary to fight against insurgency and terrorism. Okay, So in this session, we shall understand this topic in detail. We'll talk about the background. We'll understand the regions where ASPA has been uh, imposed and, and enforced. We'll talk about the provisions of the law, understand why there is a controversy, and also look at various expert suggestions from several committees, including from the Supreme Court. Okay. So the reason why it is in news is very, very important because it will give you the context. It will also let you know that this topic is going to be important for the upcoming mains exam. ASPA as a topic is a potential question in mains in GS paper 2 under polity. It could also come as a question under GS paper 3 under internal security. And this is also a potential essay topic. So considering the significance of this topic, we need to have a detailed discussion. Okay, So let's start with the background, the history behind ASPA. See, just like most of the controversial laws that we have, even ASPA 
is of colonial origin. The colonial origin of this law is largely responsible for the, for the controversial provisions that are found in this law. Now see if you look at India's policing system and security architecture, we come across many legislations. We have the Indian Penal Code or IPC, the Criminal Procedure Code or CRPC, then we have the Indian Evidence Act, the Police Act. All these security and policing related laws of India, they are all outdated. All these laws that I have mentioned here, they are of colonial origin and ASPA also falls under the same category. Now why am I highlighting this point? Why is this important? See this is important because the context in which the law was introduced plays a very very important role in the way in which the law will operate. The intentions behind the law and the context in which it was introduced plays a key role in determining how the law will operate in today's world. During the colonial era, the British government was introducing these laws mainly to repress and oppress the Indian people. The intention behind most of these colonial legislations was to break down India's national movement. It was to target our freedom fighters and our freedom struggle. So these laws were designed to favor the government and the security forces. They were designed deliberately to give enormous sweeping powers to security forces so that the police and security forces could repress and oppress the Indian people. And as per which is the topic of our discussion also falls under the same category. This law was introduced as an ordinance in 1942 to counter the quit India movement. Please remember this point, very important for prelims as well. When Viceroy Lilith Goh was heading the British government in India, the British introduced ASPA as an ordinance to target the violence that had broken out after the start of the quit India movement. If you go back to, a, to your history lessons, you will know that leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and the others, they had given the call for quit India. But even before the movement could begin, the top leaders including Mahatma Gandhi were arrested by the British. So following the arrest of the top leaders, violence broke out in different parts of India. So to contain this unrest, to deal with this violence, the British introduced ASPA or the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. They introduced it as an ordinance which gave enormous powers to the security forces. This law almost gave the license to kill for the security forces. It basically allowed them to kill anyone they suspected to be involved in violent activities. To deal with these internal disturbances, such tremendous powers were placed in the hands of the armed and the security forces. So that is why even today, the provisions of ASPA are controversial because the law was designed with the intention of repressing the Indian people. It was designed with the intention of giving sweeping powers to security forces so that they could deal with any unrest or any internal disturbances. Then in 1947, as India became independent and as the Indian subcontinent was partitioned, massive communal riots broke out in different parts of the country, especially in provinces which were being partitioned like Bengal, Assam and the others. Massive communal violence and riots had broken out. So this was essentially an internal disturbance. So to deal with that, again four more ordinances were introduced by the independent government of India to tackle the security situation. These laws, these ordinances which were brought in was again the same law which was introduced in 1942, that is ASPA or the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. But these ordinances which were introduced in 1942 and later in 1947, these were temporary in nature. They were kept in operation for a certain period of time and once the situation was contained, these ordinances were revoked. 
but post independence that is after india became fully independent and after the partition process was complete as per was introduced for the first time in the year 1958 see the first place where as per was introduced was in the northeast of india in the northeast the nagas had already taken up insurgency against the indian state the nagas had formed a political revolutionary group known as the naga national council or the nnc they had declared their independence from india in 1947 itself as they no longer wished to remain a part of the indian union after declaring independence they boycotted the elections and they took up insurgency against the indian state and they led a separatist movement to liberate the naga inhabited areas so in the naga hill regions of assam and manipur the first major insurgency had begun in post independent india the then government of assam was not able to deal with this insurgent threat this was becoming a threat for the very sovereignty of the country it was threatening the unity and the integrity of the nation so to contain the situation and to defend india's territorial sovereignty the government of india brought back this colonial era law and introduced a fresh ordinance and thus as per was brought into the northeast of india so first it was brought in to tackle naga insurgency later the law was expanded into other parts of northeast of india as different insurgencies broke out and today many states in the northeast of india they still continue to remain under the provisions of afspa later the law was also introduced in punjab and chandigarh in the 1980s in 1983 to be precise then in 1990 when insurgency and terrorism broke out in jammu and kashmir here as well as per was introduced okay so please remember this in post independent india three different afspa acts have been enacted by the parliament the first one was in the northeast of india introduced as an ordinance later enacted as a legislation of the parliament then in 1983 as per was introduced in punjab and chandigarh and in 1990 it was also introduced in jammu and kashmir later we are going to talk about these different conflict zones in more detail we'll understand how afspa has had an has had an impact with regard to india's fight against insurgency and terrorism but before that i want to take you through the provisions of this law we need to look at the specific provisions of afspa especially the important ones so that we get an idea as to why this law is so controversial so for the next few minutes i would like to explain some of the key provisions of this law and please make a note of this as it's going to be very very important for writing any mains answer see the armed forces special powers act provides for special powers to the security forces the name itself is indicating the purpose of the law it is providing special powers to the armed forces and the security forces which are deployed in counter insurgency role but for aspa to be introduced there is a condition aspa can be introduced in a conflict zone only if that region has been declared as a disturbed area i'll repeat for aspa to be implemented in a conflict zone the region has to be first declared as a disturbed area what do you mean by a disturbed area a disturbed area is any region which is witnessing disputes violence and conflicts between members of communities of different religions or different race different languages or different ethnic groups so if such disputes and violence violence exists and if there are external actors that is if there are foreign governments or foreign non state actors who are supporting these elements who are creating violence and who are disturbing peace and stability in such conflict zones especially the ones located closer to our international borders 
they can be declared as a disturbed area. Is that clear? Any area which is witness to violence and disputes between different communities and if there is an external angle to it and if the regions are located closer to our international borders, in such circumstances, the central government and the state government, they reserve the right to declare the region as a disturbed area. This provision is contained under section 3 of AFSPA. Is that clear? Under section 3 of AFSPA, violence affected regions, especially the ones hit by insurgency and terrorism, they can be declared as a disturbed area. Now the obvious question is, who has the powers to declare the area as a disturbed area? This power exists with the central government, that is of course with the home ministry, because the ministry of home affairs is the nodal ministry for India's internal security. Apart from the central government, even the governor of a state or the administrator of a union territory, even they have the powers to declare a region as a disturbed area. So once a conflict hit region has been declared as a disturbed area under section 3 of AFSPA, then the armed forces can be deployed in the region and they acquire special powers. I hope you know that armed forces generally are not deployed in an internal security role because armed forces are meant for external threats. The Indian Army, the Indian Air Force, etc. They are meant for fighting wars against other countries. They are meant for dealing with terrorism that is sponsored by a hostile country. They are not primarily meant to deal with local insurgencies. But in special circumstances, in extraordinary situations where there is a grave threat to India's sovereignty and if the local police and local administration are not able to handle the situation, right? if they are failing to contain the threat, then there is a need to bring in the armed forces. Okay? See, actually, the central government has a duty under Article 355 of the Indian Constitution. If you are well versed with polity and constitution, you will know what I am talking about. Article 355 places a duty on the central government to assist state governments in dealing with external aggression and internal disturbances. So if a state, especially if a border state, if it is affected by insurgency and terrorism and if foreign elements are involved in that, if they are sponsoring these violent activities, then the central government has a duty to assist the state governments. Because this represents an extraordinary situation. This is a situation which cannot be handled by the state police, by the local police forces. Their capacities will be overwhelmed. So in such, such circumstances, the central government can step in and deploy the armed forces to take up counter-insurgency and counter-terror operations. So to do this, right, there is a requirement for a legal backing. And the legal backing comes from AFSPA. Under Section 3, the conflicted region will be declared as a disturbed area. And once the region is declared as a disturbed area, the center will get the powers to deploy the armed forces or paramilitary forces. Right? Even Central Armed Police Forces or CAPFs, such as Assam Rifles or maybe CRPF or BSF, even such central paramilitary forces can also be deployed in conflicted areas and even they acquire the special powers along with the Indian Army. Is that clear? So the power to declare a region as a disturbed area lies with the center or the governor of a state or the administrator of a union territory. Once the region is declared as a disturbed area, ASPA provisions will be applicable and the central forces can be deployed and they all get special powers. So we need to understand what are these special powers? What kind of special powers are given to the security forces? See, as I have said, AFSPA is implemented in areas where we have active insurgencies going on, like Jammu and Kashmir, few northeastern states. So operating in these conflict zones is not an easy task. It's a very challenging environment for our security forces. Then upon that, there is the external angle. There could be a foreign government, 
a hostile intelligence agency sponsoring some of these insurgents and terrorists. There could be a foreign based terror outfit or a non-state actor who is supporting insurgents and terrorists in India. Or these insurgents, they might have a safe haven located across the border where they find a, a safe sanctuary by running away from Indian forces. So when such circumstances exist, to combat the threat and to conduct counterinsurgency and counterterror operations, our security forces require a few special powers. And those special powers are granted through this law, that is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. So now that you have understood how ASPA is introduced and what is a disturbed area, let's talk about the kind of special powers that are given. What kind of special powers are acquired by the security forces in areas where ASPA is in place? Let's talk about them one by one. See, one of the most extraordinary powers acquired by the armed forces is that they are given the right to kill if required they can open fire, use force against a suspect. If they suspect an individual to be an insurgent or a terrorist or if a suspected individual is carrying arms and ammunition and weapons, right? Security forces can conclude that he is a terrorist or an insurgent. Based on this assumption, they are given the right to kill the suspect. They can open fire and use force even going to the extent of causing the death of the suspect. Now, please note that this right has been given and this right can be exercised purely on the basis of assumption and, and a few facts which are available at that point of time. Without knowing further details about the suspect, security forces have the right to open fire and kill the individual if they have a suspicion on that individual. So this right to kill which has been given by ASPA is one of the most extraordinary powers which has been given to the security forces. Because generally in a constitutional democracy, right to life of an individual cannot be snatched away by the state so easily. If you have read about article 21 of the constitution, it provides for right to life and liberty. The article clearly says that the life of an individual can be taken by the state only as per the procedure established by law. But without establishing the facts, based on suspicion and assumptions, security forces have been given the right to kill the suspect, to kill the individual. So this is why it's an extraordinary power which has been given to security forces under AFSPA. Next, they also have the power to arrest any suspect or any person without a warrant without even obtaining a legal warrant from the local magistrate, they can arrest the suspect and place them in detention or in custody. Is that clear? That's an extraordinary power again. Then security forces also get the power to enter and search any property or any premises without a warrant. If they suspect that there could be terrorists hiding in a building, or if there is a suspicion that there could be weapons and ammunition stored in a building, the property could be searched. Security forces can enter the building, break down the locks and search the entire premises without a warrant. This again is an extraordinary power because this is not possible in regular circumstances. Let's say in a normal region like let's say Delhi or Mumbai, right? If the police have to enter your premises, they need a warrant, they need the legal mandate. Without that, they cannot search your property, your premises and they cannot arrest the individual. This law is giving these extraordinary powers to security forces as they are operating in a insurgency hit area. Okay? Then, apart from entering the property, security forces also have the right to destroy the property if required. They have the right to destroy any structures or fortified positions or shelters which they believe that could be used as a hideout by the terrorists or insurgents. So if security forces have an assumption or a suspicion that a particular house is a hideout for terrorists, 
they could target the building and demolish the building if needed and for all of this the security forces will not face any legal action there is no legal action taken against the security forces even if there is a mistake on their part so that is why it is said the provisions of aspa are extraordinary powers and and they give sweeping powers to the security forces but the most controversial provision of aspa is contained under section 6 of the act apart from all these extraordinary powers it has been said that the personnel of the armed forces and security forces they are not liable for prosecution basically they have been given legal immunity they have been given legal immunity from any prosecution in such incidents in such cases let's say in a encounter security forces have killed a suspect or they have destroyed someone's property or they have arrested a person without a warrant in such cases even if mistakes have been made even if it's a fake encounter or a fake killing you cannot file cases against the security force security forces cannot be prosecuted the personnel of the army and the paramilitary forces they have been given this immunity and it has been provided under section 6 of aspa this section reads no prosecution suit or any other legal proceeding can be instituted except with previous sanction of the central government the only way in which you can prosecute the security forces the personnel who did this is by obtaining the permission or the prior sanction of the central government so without the center's approval the personnel who are involved in the operations they cannot be prosecuted see now the argument is there are proponents of the law who say that such extraordinary powers are needed for the forces because they are operating in very difficult circumstances because in a conflict zone especially when there is support from across the border it's not easy to identify who is a terrorist and who is not right especially in places where attacks are happening frequently on a day to day basis right any individual could be a potential suspect so any delay in taking decisions on the part of the armed forces could result in a terror attack so they need to make split second decisions on the ground and hence they argue that such special powers are needed and they also need this immunity so that the armed forces are not targeted on the basis of fake encounters and fake killings because if this immunity doesn't exist then the security forces will lose their morale and motivation to operate in a conflict zone like i said operating in a conflict zone and getting involved in counter insurgency and counter terror operations is very very challenging so the proponents they say that if this immunity is not given if these special powers are not provided the armed forces will not be able to operate in these hostile conditions they will lose their morale and motivation thereby creating a security gap in our security architecture they say that it could be a threat to our country's integrity and sovereignty but those who are opposed to the law they say that when such special powers are given without any checks and balances and when there is no accountability right when there is no accountability what will happen to these personnel or these officials who might have deliberately committed human rights violations there is a possibility that there could be few rogue officers right there have been few instances where fake killings have happened rapes and murders have happened kidnappings and forced disappearances have been reported so in such cases how will the personnel who are responsible for this how will they be held accountable right how will the guilty be punished if such immunity is granted and to prosecute them you need the prior approval the prior sanction of the central government so this is a clear case of conflict of interest because the government would hesitate to give the sanction because this issue could become political and most central governments would try to 
protect the armed forces. They may not give the sanction that is needed to prosecute the, the, the accused officers. So this is where the controversy lies. That is why section 6 of the act is very important. It basically grants immunity to the security forces for all the acts that they commit in areas where AFSPA is in operation. They cannot be held accountable for their acts unless and until the central government gives permission. Is that clear? So these are the important provisions of AFSPA. So through the next part of the discussion, we will understand how AFSPA has of operated in different conflict zones of India. We will also understand as to how these provisions might be misused by a few rogue officers and how this could violate the human rights of the local people. Okay? Let us start by talking about the operation of AFSPA in the northeast of India. Because this is the region where AFSPA was introduced for the first time in post-independent India. Right? We already discussed that AFSPA was introduced in 1958 to tackle Naga insurgency. It was made applicable to the Naga hill areas of Assam and Manipur to tackle Naga insurgency which had broken out in 1950s. Then later the northeast region was reorganized, right? different states were created, union territories were created and from 1960s till 1990s, many different insurgent movements began in different northeastern states. In 1960s for example, Insurgency broke out in Manipur and as well as in Mizoram. Then later in 1970s, insurgencies broke out in Assam, in Tripura and later in Meghalaya as well. So at one point, multiple insurgent groups were operating in the northeast of India and they, they all had different causes and different motivations but they were representing a grave threat to our security. Many of these insurgent groups, they were separatist outfits. They were seeking the liberation of that region from the Indian Union. So this insurgent movement, which was going on across the northeast of India, was a threat to India's sovereignty and integrity. So to deal with that, the ASPA which was in place to deal with Naga insurgency was expanded further. As different insurgencies broke out in Manipur, Assam, Tripura, etc., AFSPA was also modified and it was expanded to cover all the northeastern states at one point of time. Even Arunachal Pradesh was brought under AFSPA as it shares a border with Myanmar. Many of these northeast rebels, they were using Arunachal Pradesh as a sanctuary, as a safe haven. And through Arunachal Pradesh, they were moving across the border into Myanmar. So all the northeastern states at one point were brought under AFSPA. So accordingly, this legislation of 1958 was modified and today we refer to this as just AFSPA of 1958. When it was introduced, it was named after Assam and Manipur because that is where it was implemented initially to deal with Naga insurgency. But later when different insurgencies broke out in different states, AFSPA was expanded and it was renamed and modified as well. Okay? But today, AFSPA is in operation in only few parts of northeast of India. It has been withdrawn and removed in a few states. Because in states like Mizoram, Tripura and Meghalaya, insurgency has declined and almost it has come to an end. So in these few states, AFSPA has been withdrawn. For example, in Mizoram, in 1980s, to be precise in 1986-87, the Mizo insurgency was brought to an end by signing a peace accord with the Mizo insurgents. A few years later, violence declined, insurgency went down, so AFSPA provisions were withdrawn. Then recently in uh, 2015, in Tripura as well, AFSPA was withdrawn because Tripura was also violence free. The insurgency was brought to an end and since peace and normalcy was restored, the state government passed a resolution which withdrew the designation of Tripura as a disturbed area. So once the disturbed area designation was removed, 
automatically aspa became inoperable the central government agreed to it and the center withdrew aspa from tripura then more recently in 2018 in the state of meghalaya even here aspa was operating in a few districts and since insurgency had gone down and since the violence had come to an end aspa has been withdrawn but in other parts of northeast of india like in the entire state of nagaland in the entire state of assam in the entire state of manipur except the impal municipal area region and as well as in few parts of arunachal pradesh aspa is still in operation okay so what you can understand from this is that aspa is a law which can be applied for an entire state if required or it can be implemented in few parts of a state which is affected by insurgency let's say only few districts of a state are affected by insurgency only those districts can be declared as a disturbed area and only in those districts aspa can be implemented okay so that is the point you need to note aspa can be implemented in an entire state or it can be implemented in just a few parts of a state so this is the status of aspa in the northeast of india but over the decades it has led to allegations of gross human right violations it has been alleged that indian security forces have committed quite a few human right violations including fake encounters rapes and torture by misusing the powers of aspa these are the allegations that exist next aspa was introduced in punjab and chandigarh in 1983 to tackle the kalistan threat the kalistan insurgency which had broken out right the various kalistan extremist groups they were demanding independence and they were backed by pakistan and its intelligence agency the isi so to contain the threat india implemented aspa by declaring punjab and chandigarh as a disturbed area but by 1990s kalistan insurgency was broken up india neutralized the threat very quickly and as the threat went down as violence came to an end in early 1990s aspa was withdrawn from punjab and chandigarh in 1997 so it was in operation for a few years but once the threat ended once the insurgency was brought to an end india revoked or withdrew aspa from punjab next in 1990 insurgency and terrorism had broken out in jammu and kashmir again this was backed directly by pakistan the pakistani army and isi they were directly involved in supporting the kashmiri separatists then pakistan based terror groups like the lashkar e toiba the hizbul mujahideen and the others they were enabling insurgency and terrorism in kashmir so due to the nature of this cross border terrorism and separatist insurgency which had broken out india implemented aspa in jammu and kashmir as well this law continues to remain in operation in jnk even today because the security threat remains and persists till date okay in jammu and kashmir the armed forces have argued that the law is very essential to 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 counter terrorism and insurgency which is largely sponsored by pakistan but however there have been instances here and there where human right violations have been reported again fake killings rapes and murders and kidnappings have been reported and there are very strong allegations against the indian army some of you might know about the shopian killings of 2009 this was one incident where there were strong allegations against the indian army against a few rogue officers who reportedly had killed innocents in the name of countering ter terrorism and insurgency okay but this case has never reached its logical end the guilty officers were never identified or punished and the controversy continues so there have been allegations of violations in jnk in punjab and in the northeast and this is what leads activists to call for the repeal of this law but however the government and the armed forces they strongly defend the law 
because they say that without the law, armed forces cannot operate in such difficult conditions. So let us get a better insight into the controversy around AFSPA. Let us see what the civil society activists and human rights organizations are saying about AFSPA. See they argue that wherever AFSPA has been imposed, there has been a culture of abuse, misuse and oppression that has been promoted. Based on the experience of the last few decades, civil society activists, human rights organizations and even international organizations, they have pointed out that wherever ASPA has been imposed, gross human rights violations have been reported. They blame the colonial legacy of the law for this. As I explained earlier, the intention of the law when it was introduced in 1942 was to repress the people, to oppress the people, to give enormous powers to security forces so that they could deal with any disturbances. So when you continue those laws with the same spirit and intention, chances are high that the same mistakes would be repeated. So that is one reason why there is strong opposition against AFSPA. So these activists and these organizations, they have brought up some evidence, prima facie evidence to show that Indian forces have committed fake encounters, fake killings, rapes, tortures and even kidnappings and forced disappearances. Again, I am not saying it happens very frequently, right? This is purely based on available facts. The Indian armed forces and security forces are thoroughly professional forces. They are known for respecting the constitution and the law of the land. But still, in a conflict zone, there might be few rogue officers here and there who will commit such violations once in a while, right? And that will bring a bad name to the entire organization and to the government itself. So, activist groups have brought out such incidents into limelight. The media also has played a big role in highlighting such incidents. So, there is strong evidence available to indicate in some cases, in some incidents, human rights violations have been committed. But however, the immunity given by the law prevents the prosecution of these rogue officers. They cannot be held accountable because an honest, transparent investigation is highly unlikely to take place because the government would like to protect its image. It will try to shield the armed forces as well. And as a result, in most cases, permissions are not given for transparent investigation. In fact, the local police, they are even prevented from filing cases or complaints against the security forces. So this immunity, right, in a way becomes a blanket immunity. So when complete immunity is given indirectly, chances are high that the guilty officers will never be held accountable. So that is one issue that the opponents of the law have pointed out. Here I can give you one popular example. There was a very popular activist in Manipur known as Airom Sharmila. She is known for her, her hunger strike against the Indian government and the Indian forces. And she carried out a hunger strike for almost 16 years. She was protesting against fake killings that had happened in Manipur in 2000, where a unit of the Indian Army and Assam Rifles had allegedly killed innocent people. So to protest against it and to call for the repeal of AFSPA, Airom Sharbila went on a hunger strike. So she represents the opposition against AFSPA. She has highlighted the kind of atrocities that allegedly have taken place in some of the conflict zones. Then it is also important to note that experts argue that provisions of AFSPA, they violate the Indian constitution and they also violate some of the international conventions. I already explained that provisions of AFSPA could go against Article 21. Right? It could be argued that Article 21 which gives us right to life and as the constitution lays down, right to life can be taken away by the state only as per procedure established by law. But AFSPA gives such tremendous powers that without even following the procedure established by law, the forces can use force to kill a suspect. So that could be argued as a violation of Article 21. Even Article 22, it provides protection against arrest and detention. 
but as you saw under aspa security forces have tremendous powers to arrest and detain without a warrant so that could be considered as a violation of article 22 similarly it is argued that aspa violates many international conventions like the universal declaration of human rights international covenant on civil and political rights the convention against torture the un code of conduct for law enforcement officials the un body of principles for protection of all persons under any form of detention un principles on effective prevention and investigation of extra legal arbitrary and summary executions these are some un conventions and international conventions that provide for the protection of human rights provide basic civil and political rights and they prevent extra judicial killings and torture india actually has signed quite a few of these conventions so it is said that provisions of aspa violate these international conventions in fact in 2012 the united nations itself had criticized aspa the un human rights council and as well as the un they had said that a law like aspa has no place in a constitutional democracy like india they had called upon india to revoke the law and to withdraw this controversial law so as you can see there is strong opposition against this legislation but however that is one side of the argument so let's take a look at the other side of the argument let's understand what the government and the security forces are saying about aspa see the government and the forces they have strongly defended the law and they say that it is an absolute necessity to fight insurgency and terrorism in the conflict hit zones of india like i said especially if there is an external angle if there is a threat to the country's sovereignty then security forces and the government believe that these special powers are absolutely necessary to shield and protect the armed forces and to give them special powers so that they could effectively tackle the security threat as i explained earlier security forces definitely face very challenging and very difficult circumstances sometimes they may have to make split second decisions they have to determine whether the individual in front of them is a innocent or a suspected terrorist right so if they get the call wrong if they make a wrong decision it might result in the loss of lives it might result in a terror attack or if they get it wrong otherwise as well if they kill a innocent that could also result in a controversy so that is the reason why the government and the armed forces argue that immunity is needed from prosecution without immunity the forces cannot operate on the ground because before they carry out an operation before they open fire they will have to think 10 times because they fear the consequences so when the fear of the consequences is there it will slow down the decision making and reduce the effectiveness of the security operations so that is one side of the argument but however when such powers are given without checks and balances without accountability chances are high that it could be misused every now and then like i said the indian forces are known for their professionalism right the indian forces have established themselves as a professional force committed to the constitution and the law of the land but now and then there could be few rogue officers who might commit these mistakes who might abuse the law and bring a bad name to the entire organization the government says that the immunity given under aspa is not blanket immunity it says in genuine cases we will take up investigation we will thoroughly enquire into such allegations and ensure that guilty officers are punished so government and armed forces have promised this accountability they argue that this immunity given is not blanket immunity is it clear the immunity might be breached if there is a strong evidence that the encounter was a fake encounter but unfortunately we haven't seen many examples in most allegations in most cases in jammu and kashmir in punjab and in the northeast honest and transparent investigations haven't taken place there are few examples where the government has proactively acted the army has acted proactively but in most cases such proactive action has not been taken this brings us to one recent incident which happened last year known as the amshipura fake encounter in jammu and kashmir 
in this incident a few rogue officers of the indian army had killed innocents and they had labeled them as terrorists but there was strong evidence to show that it was a fake killing a fake encounter so investigations began there was a lot of protests a lot of opposition against aspa finally the government and the indian army acted and the indian army conducted a thorough internal investigation they found a lot of discrepancies in the in the manner in which the operation was carried out and as a result the suspected officers the accused officers they are currently being court martialed okay so this gives some hope that there are few instances examples here and there to show that the army and the government are trying to be more responsible they are trying to be more transparent about the investigations and they are trying to hold the guilty accountable but in most cases it doesn't happen because the sanctions the permissions are not granted is it clear even if enquiries happen the guilty they are not really punished at the end of it the cases drag for years together so the victims don't get their justice so that is why aspa is heavily criticized by the opponents is it clear another criticism is that the cases are taken up within the armed forces they take it up for court martial they don't try these cases in in regular criminal courts in cases where court martial is taken up there is lot of opaqueness right there is no transparency in, involved in cases you know which are taken to court martial so there is a demand that these cases should be taken up for prosecution at regular criminal courts at civilian courts where public and media have access so that is one more criticism which has come up against aspa and against the government and the security forces however the government and the security forces have said that there are enough safety nets to prevent the misuse of aspa they point out that under the law the security forces have to give out a prior warning before they open fire this is a mandate of the law then any suspect who is apprehended or detained by the forces they should be handed over to local police within 24 hours <coughs> this was a guideline which was laid down by the supreme court itself so that acts as a safety net which can prevent the abuse of the law then armed forces must act in cooperation with local administration they shouldn't operate independently that's one more restriction placed under the law and before aspa is extended indefinitely it has to be reviewed every 6 months and only then it has to be extended depending on the security situation in that region these restrictions have been placed okay even this was a guideline given by the supreme court the last one but in reality most of the guidelines are not followed for example before opening fire prior warnings may not be given after the forces detain a suspect they don't produce them to the local police within 24 hours this guideline of the supreme court is not followed in many cases then the armed forces in many cases they operate independently for maintaining the secrecy of the operation they don't involve the local police and the and the district administration so they violate this guideline as well but the fourth guideline is stringently followed before aspa is extended a thorough review is conducted every 6 months and depending on security situation it is extended for another 6 months so this guideline of the supreme court is followed but other restrictions and guidelines are usually breached by the security forces okay so now before we end the topic let us take a look at the opinion of other institutions and other experts and eminent people let's see what the supreme court has said about aspa let's see what different committees have said about aspa so that will give us a fair balanced opinion and it helps us to conclude the discussion as well see in 1998 the supreme court was looking at a case filed by the naga people's movement of human rights this case questioned the constitutional validity of aspa in this case the supreme court upheld the constitutional validity and said that aspa is not arbitrary it's not unreasonable so it does not violate the constitution or its basic structure 
so basically the supreme court upheld the law but however it did recognize that the law could be misused and hence it laid down a couple of guidelines two important guidelines were laid down which is nothing but producing the detained in front of the local police within 24 hours and reviewing aspa every 6 months before it is extended so these two important guidelines were laid down by the supreme court in the 1998 case but however it upheld the law it did not declare it as unconstitutional because the judiciary doesn't like to step into the domain of the government and the legislature right it's not the job of the judiciary to check whether the law is in breach of basic human right provisions and the constitutional provisions yes the judiciary does have the power to declare something as unconstitutional but here as the matter concerns the security of the nation and since it's an executive policy which has been enacted by the parliament the judiciary often maintains a certain distance without in order to not to interfere with the jurisdiction of the government and the parliament so by looking at the basic provisions the supreme court declared the law to be constitutional but it did lay down a few important guidelines next in 2016 there was a very important case it was filed by a manipur based ngo which was fighting for the victims of extrajudicial executions that had happened this ngo had conducted a study collected some evidence and it was claiming that more than 1500 civilians were killed by security forces in manipur since the start of insurgency in 1960s based on these allegations based on these reports a case was filed and the supreme court went into the details of the case the supreme court was very critical of aspa this time because it said there is no concept of absolute immunity yes immunity is essential for the forces but it can't be absolute it can't be a blanket immunity so the supreme court ordered in this case that every killing every death in disturbed areas be it insurgent or a civilian it has to be thoroughly investigated because even an insurgent or a terrorist does enjoy basic human rights they can't be killed in fake encounters they can't be tortured so the supreme court laid down this guideline that in a disturbed area every killing with a security force be it a civilian or an insurgent it has to be thoroughly investigated because there is nothing called as absolute immunity next in a follow up case in 2017 the same group manipur based group had filed a pil a public interest litigation it it was an extension of this case in this case again the supreme court ruled that yes in some cases security forces might have committed violations it observed that there is initial evidence to show that violations might have happened so it ordered the cbi to investigate some of the alleged fake encounters in manipur so these two rulings of the supreme court especially of 2016 and 2017 they are very important because it recognizes the potential for misuse that lies under aspa okay in 98 two important guidelines were laid down and in 2016 and 2017 the supreme court did highlight the the problems that exist with the law but it hasn't gone for changing the law or repealing the law on its own because it doesn't want to step into the domain of the government and the legislature next there are two important committees which have inquired into the provisions of aspa in 2005 a innocent civilian known as tangja manorama was killed in manipur by the assam rifles this triggered a huge backlash in Manipur, led to a lot of protests and very strong calls came up for, re for repealing AFSPA. Following this incident, the government of India constituted a committee under Justice BP Jeevan Reddy, known as the Jeevan Reddy Commission. This committee thoroughly inquired into the incident and carried out a thorough review of the provisions of AFSPA. The committee submitted the report and it said that aspa should be repealed aspa should be repealed because it's not just controversial it is giving sweeping powers and immunity to security forces the committee also highlighted that aspa has become an object of hate and an instrument of discrimination and high-handedness 
at the hands of the security forces. These were very strong observations that were made by the BP G1 Ready Committee. It also suggested that instead of ASPA, the UAPA or the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that itself could be amended to deal with terrorism and insurgency. It said a colonial law like ASPA is not needed. Remove the law, repeal it because it is giving sweeping powers. It's leading to human rights violations. Instead, amend UP UAPA or bring in a new law which is sufficient to deal with terrorism and insurgency. So such recommendations were given by the BP G1 Ready Commission. Then in 2013, the Santosh Hegde Committee was constituted because the alleged killings in Manipur had become very controversial. The NGO which had filed petitions to the Supreme Court was fighting for justice for the victims of these extrajudicial killings. It was alleging that more than 1500 civilians had been killed from 1960s. So based on these allegations, the Supreme Court itself constituted a committee under Justice Santosh Hegde. This committee was also very, very critical of AFSPA. After its review, it pointed out that it investigated six cases of alleged fake encounters and found that all six of them were fake encounters. They were not genuine. They were staged killings. It identified that disproportionate force had been used by the security forces and innocent civilians who had no criminal history had been targeted and killed and later they were branded as terrorists or insurgents. So Santosh Hegde committee also pointed out that ASPA is giving sweeping powers and it's leading to violation of human rights. So the recommendations of these committees are very very important because you can use them in your answers to take a balanced position. Okay. So there are many other committees, many institutions, many people who have spoken about ASPA, they've criticized it. For example, the second ARC, the second Administrative Reforms Commission, it agreed with the recommendations of the Justice G1 Ready Commission. Then former Home Secretary GK Pillai, he supported the repeal of ASPA. He publicly supported the repeal of ASPA after he retired from service. Then Justice Verma Commission, the Just Justice J.S. Verma Commission, which was set up to, you know, reform the criminal system after the Nirbhaya gang rape case, it, it pointed out that several incidents of sexual abuse and sexual violence had been committed by the forces under AFSPA provisions. It recommended few changes to AFSPA so that women in areas of AFSPA could be protected against such acts of sexual abuse and violence. Former Home Minister P. Chidambaram, he said once that if the act cannot be repealed, if the act is absolutely essential, then at least amend it, make it more humane, ensure that it doesn't lead to violation of human rights. Even the NHRC, the National Human Rights Commission, has taken note of these concerns. It has issued many notices and sought reports from the central government and from the security forces. But NHRC can't act on its own, it doesn't have those powers, but it has taken note of these incidents, issued notices and sought reports from them. So these are the arguments against AFSPA, okay? But however, there are security experts, there are strategic experts who argue that AFSPA is a necessary evil. They say that for a country like India, AFSPA is essential to protect the country's sovereignty. Okay, because India is a victim of proxy wars. India is a victim of state-sponsored terrorism and insurgency. As I explained earlier, countries like Pakistan, at one point, elements in Bangladesh, few elements in Myanmar, right? They, all, they have all been known to support insurgents and terrorists who are operating in India. Right? Hostile countries like Pakistan and China, they have been sponsoring insurgencies and terrorism as, their, as a part of their proxy war against India. So this represents an extraordinary situation. Regular laws, ordinary laws are not sufficient to deal with that. Your local police, they are incapable of dealing with such situations. So that is why they argue that 
we need special laws like AFSPA and even if they are a little stringent, even if it is leading to some incidents of misuse, we need such laws so that security forces have that immunity, have that special power to deal with terrorists and insurgent threats. They say that if it is removed, then army cannot be deployed in these roles, in counterinsurgency roles. And this will create a huge gap in our security architecture. That is why they say that AFSPA is a necessary evil. Okay? So coming to the end of our discussion, we have seen the different sides of the argument, but we can conclude one thing and we can agree on one thing that AFSPA might be necessary. Yes, I'm not denying that. AFSPA is required for sec security forces as they need some protection and immunity when they are operating in a difficult situation. But however, changes are needed. The government cannot continue the current situation. Status quo is not feasible because many experts, many committees, the Supreme Court itself has pointed out that gross violations are taking place under AFSPA. The victims have been denied justice. So in these circumstances, status quo is not possible. It's not feasible. Either the government should consider repealing the law itself and bring in a new law or it can consider amending the law as suggested by former Home Minister P. Chidambaram. That's one of the options. See, in a conflict zone, it's very important for the government and the armed forces to gain the trust of the local people. They have to promise to the locals that if injustice is done to them, if they have been victims of violence from the state, they should be given justice. The government has to send out this message and deliver on this promise. Similarly, armed forces, they have to build that relationship. They have to create trust with the local population because without this trust, the armed forces will not be able to conduct effective security operations. So what can be done is that on one hand, honest and transparent investigations have to take place into allegations of human rights violations. These investigations, they, have, they will have to be fast tracked. Okay? So that quick justice, speedy justice is delivered to the victims. And instead of following opaque process of investigation and, and prosecution, there should be a transparent process where the officers, the guilty officers could be held accountable and given the strictest of punishment. So that is an absolute must. And instead of imposing AFSPA for the entire state, the government can impose AFSPA only for few places, few districts, and that too for a temporary period. So when there is a security threat, impose AFSPA for few months, contain the threat, and once terrorism and insurgency goes down, AFSPA can be removed on a case-to-case -case basis. So this will reduce the scope for its misuse, and it will not affect the basic rights, the human rights of the local population. So on a case-to-case -case basis, AFSPA will have to be reviewed, implemented in district-to-district -district level, instead of implementing it to the entire state. Then finally, government has to follow some of the recommendations given by the key institutions and committees. Strictly, the Supreme Court guidelines have to be followed. Recommendations of Jeevan Reddy Commission, Santosh Hegde Committee can be implemented. Right? The law could be either repealed and a new law could be brought in to protect the armed forces with checks and balances. Or existing law could be amended. It could be made more humane to balance both the sides. So these recommendations, these, these uh, expert opinions, they have to be taken in by the government. Okay? So with this, I would like to conclude the discussion for today. We have covered AFSPA in detail, including its background, the way in which it has operated and why there is a controversy. We have also had a balanced discussion on different sides of the argument. This analysis right, will be helpful for your mains exam. Like I said, you can expect potential questions in polity, in internal security, or maybe even an essay topic. So I hope the discussion was helpful. Do let me know how it was in the comment section below. And like I said, don't forget to like the videos and also subscribe to our channel. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll meet you again next week, that is next Friday, with a new topic for the Explained series. Thank you. Good night.